This is Death in Ice Valley, an original podcast series from the BBC World Service and NRK. I'm Marit Igraf. And I'm Neil McCarthy. And this is episode two, A Case of Clues. We've been looking through police files, reports and documents from the end of November 1970 to piece together the East of Women's movements. And the last thing we were talking about was that the police had made an important discovery in the railway station in Bergen. So I think we should go there. Yes, let's go there with the crime novelist Gunnar Stolesen. He was a young man in Bergen when this was the country's biggest story. And he's still hungry for answers. You know, in uh, the United States, nobody 100% sure who killed President Kennedy. And it's the same with uh, Prime Minister Olof Palme in Sweden, who was killed. That is two very internationally known unsolved cases. In, in my head, even if it's not that dramatic in the political world, then I would say that the Ice Valley woman is in the same sort of unsolved mystery as the killing of Kennedy and Palme. I am sure that still, after 47 years, there are somebody living who knows more about this case, perhaps even in Bergen. Now we are in the railway station uh, of Bergen. Uh, at that time, it was a little bit different. Where we stand now, there was a kiosk where you could buy newspapers and all that. And you had something uh, luggage to deliver. There was that part. But today, it's lug- luggage lockers. But at that time, you had to deliver it to a man who took them behind uh, somewhere in the shelves in there. Because when you delivered the luggage here, it was for some days, and if you go gone past that time, you had to pay. And so I guess this was some luggages that nobody had picked up. And, uh, of course, the people here could read about this woman in the newspaper, and they uh, told the police, and the police came here, and they phoned the suitcases. These suitcases were here, they were put in here on the 23rd of November. Mm-hmm. But hang on, she put the suitcases here on the 23rd of November. Her body was found in the valley on the 29th. What about those six days? Nobody knows what happened during those days. No reported sightings. She just checked in her luggage and left. Perhaps to the Isdal Valley, perhaps somewhere else. So, Mary, what did the police find in these suitcases? Oh, they found a lot. So there were wigs, glasses uh, without an actual uh, correction in the glass, just just a zero glass. Just for show. Just for show, obviously pointing out that that this was a woman trying to change her looks now and then. And sophisticated clothes, different kind of clothes, coats, uh, bathrobes, uh, cosmetic articles. So lots of fine clothing, she dressed well, she had a wig... For fashion or for disguise? And again, all labels were taken off the clothes and rubbed off uh, the items. So just like the labels on her clothes and and the objects around her dead body had all been removed. But I don't know really what to make of that. Well, there were one or two exceptions. They found a matchbox with a label on it and it came from an erotic underwear postal order service in Germany. It's a well-known chain of sex shops today. Interesting, if she's removing nearly all the labels, she'd leave that one on. A place that sells erotic underwear in 1970 sounds quite uncommon. And if she was a woman travelling around, possibly alone, could she have been involved in the sex industry in some way? Well, we just don't know that yet. OK, well, what else did they find in the suitcases? The most significant thing for the police, what they found in the suitcases, were a notebook with these codes. So they had her handwriting then, and they had some codes which they had to find out. A code book? I mean, not everyone travels around with a code book. 
Of course they understood this is something significant. We need to know what does this mean. So they contacted a specialist in the military intelligence service in Norway to help them. Another very interesting and important finding was a plastic bag with the name of a shoe store in Stavanger, which led them to Stavanger because they understood, okay, this this woman must have been in Stavanger. Anyway, to find the suitcases here at the train station was a very important thing for the police. Mm -hmm. That's a real box of treats for an investigating police officer. We've got wigs, we've got glasses with artificial lenses, books with some kind of code written on them. And this identifiable shoe shop bag from Stavanger. Where, where is Stavanger? Stavanger is a city in the southern part of Norway. Is the shop still there? Yes, actually, the shoe shop still exists. It's a family business. We can go there. We should. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to deduce that here was a woman who changed her identity. And I don't know, she could have been a spy. So many leads all of a sudden. But one thing, before we get carried away with this, how were the police so sure that these were her suitcases, her belongings? I mean, I know they had the labels scratched out, but what else? What they found there was a very clear fingerprint on the lens of a pair of sunglasses. And it matched with the finger from the dead body. Mm -hmm. So she left two suitcases, which turned out to be full of odd clues in the left luggage office either to be collected later by her as she never expected to die, or to leave a series of riddles for the police in the event of her death. This is one of the, one of the questions that my, one had to solve, that only she or perhaps some other can uh, tell us. We have to try to solve riddle upon riddle. police were first on the scene in 1970 to try and solve all those riddles. And Marit, you've read pretty much all the police files from the time. Yes, the woman we know as the Easter woman. The police traced all her movements around Norway. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves, though. Let's start with that shoe shop bag in her suitcase and board a ferry. We're on the sun deck of an ocean-going vessel on a very established sea route between the city of Bergen in the west of Norway and Stavanger in the south. And it's the first time in a few days that the rain has cleared and the sun has come out. We're leaving the islands behind, the fractured landscape of the Norwegian archipelago and coming out to more open sea. The low-lying islands with minimal vegetation. You can't see a tree really until you go a bit further inland. There's a, there's a lighthouse and a few scattered houses, but it's pretty barren and pretty windswept and very exposed to the elements. But this route has a particular connection to our story and the Istal woman. Yeah, it definitely has, because we know that the woman, the Istal woman, she was traveling this route at least two times. We know she left from Stavanger to Bergen once, and she left from Bergen to Stavanger once because we have seen the documentation in her tickets. Mm -hmm. And she went by boat? She went by boat. Do we know what drew her to Stavanger? No, we don't know her motive for going there. What we know is that she was there several times. She stayed in hotels there, two hotels, as far as we know. Can you tell me a little bit more about Stavanger? Well, it's the oil capital of Norway, where the oil industry with all the big companies have their main offices. Mm -hmm. And the workers, of course, they live in and outside of Stavanger or Bergen, going offshore to to have their duty for a week, two weeks. So let's 
see what Stavanger can tell us. Absolutely, yes. So it's another city on the southern coast. But I have to say, it's just a beautiful journey, a very wild cruise we're on here. There's sea spray in the air. The waves are starting to break. We came out of the fjords with big mountains either side of us, and now they're lower islands and almost just bare rock. The waves are lashing against them, and, and the boat is starting to rock quite a lot now. Our hairdos are getting more and more messy by the minute. But you look like you've got good sea legs. I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit queasy. Well, I'm a, as a good Norwegian, I have to survive this boat trip. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you too, actually. <laughs> We're in the city centre of Stavanger on a cobbled street next to uh, Skoringen, the shoe shop. Just in front of the shoe shop is, is a trolley with a, a selection of rubber boots. So the rubber boots and this shop are key to what we know about her story. Yes, because we're, we're not only following in the footsteps of the Iceland woman. We know she was traveling from Bergen to Stavanger and back. But we're also following in the footsteps of the police investigation in 1970. Because when they found this suitcases uh, in the railway station in Bergen. The only piece of evidence they found that actually led them somewhere outside of the railway station or outside of Bergen was this plastic bag with the name on of a shoe shop here in Stavanger. And they linked that plastic bag to a pair of rubber boots which they found on the spot where the body was found. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is where the wall, the back wall of the of the sh shop was. So we had st stock in there and down in the basement. And up this is Rolf Ruertvet in his late sixties, goatee beard and glasses. Our first witness to actually see the Estal woman alive as a young twenty-two-year-old shopkeeper in 1970. The shop is called Oscar Ruertvet's. <laughs> You're getting there with your Norwegian. Maybe you should practice a bit more. Uh, the name was Oskar Rørtvets Skotøyforretning. So uh, when the Gestalt woman came in, I tried to sell her rubber boots and they were standing over here in this corner. So we stood a lo quite a long time just here, you know, trying to sell it. And she was so, you know... Use so much time, you know, trying to decide whether to to try, to buy them or not. And she was walking to and from and looking in the mirror. She she didn't seem worried or anything. Just she couldn't make up her mind. So sort of. and she came back the next day and bought them. Yeah. You remember her? Distinctly. Oh, I do. Yes, because it's it's not every day that you sell a pair of rubber boots and a couple of days later, you know, police turn up and asking about this uh, happening and this person. So that was uh, the reason I, I keep on remembering, I think. That was the interesting thing, that the police actually in her one suitcase found yeah. the plastic bag from this door. I think it was and the only, uh, what do you call it, the connection to, connection to, the, to the, other, the rest of the world, you know, because she had put and cut away all the labels. On everything. So that was strange. And what do you remember about her? Well, she was a very, what do you say, well-dressed, good-looking, you know, just behaving very normal. But uh, she used a lot of time buying boots. But I thought, oh, yeah, she's a stranger. They're different abroad in her country. And she spoke with an accent. She was talking with an accent. She spoke English, English but with, with an, accent. an accent. Yes. So you could tell she wasn't English. Yes, yes, absolutely. And Rolf's clear about a few things. One, that she was very indecisive when she was buying these boots. And the other thing is that he, his observation was that she wasn't Norwegian. He calls her a stranger. And Stavanger is a very cosmopolitan city today with lots of foreign visitors. But I wonder about back in 1970. Oh, I think it was rare with foreigners in Stavanger in 1970. And I, I guess it must have been especially rare if she was a woman travelling alone. I mean... 
which we don't know, but that must have been very seldom. Were there other things that struck you? There was only one thing. It was a nice-looking woman, and but she, she didn't have a good smell. <laughs> we don't want to talk, talk negative about our customers. You know, we have police asking, and she smelled. Garlic wasn't that uh, common at the time, so I, I was think I thought about it later. You know, maybe it was garlic that smelled, but she didn't smell good. That was sort of the only negative thing I could say. So, um, is this a police report, Marit? Is this yes, a police? it's a description here from when she came to your shoe store. Mm-hmm. Um, is that Says, me or my colleague uh, it's speaking? It's your colleague, yeah. Sulfrid, mm. saying this woman was around 1 meter 70, dark hair down to the shoulders, mm. and she had a blue hairband, brown eyes. The lady was dressed in a dress and had a jacket of artificial fur. It was short, and she asked for rubber boots size 37. They were too small. And it says that that you then went to the basement to find number 38. On the way to the basement, the lady uh, was shouting something after you, but then in a different language than English, it says. And... You presumed it was German, but it could have been French. And that the lady looked like a French type of person because she had a golden skin and a typical South European look. Mm. Your colleague here in the shoe store, she also told the police about a bad smell, a bad perfume smell. Yeah. That this woman... Yeah. Yeah. She, uh, definitely she, she, smelled something yeah, strange. Yeah, there was it's a strange smell, absolutely. So when the police started the uh, investigation here in Stavanger after finding this plastic bag with the name of the shoe shop, they obviously, obviously uh, at first hand took contact with the shoe shop and then finding out that hmm, this must be the same woman buying her rubber boots in this shoe shop. They started the investigation around the shoe shops at the hotels nearby and they quickly landed here at this nearest hotel uh, finding out uh, that hmm, they had a woman as guest for some days um, with a foreign look and Matching the description. Matching the descriptions under the name of Finella Lork. Ah, uh-huh. Finella Lork. That's an unusual name. It sounds... I don't know, where, where did she put a nationality down in her registration card? Yes, she wrote on the hotel card that she was bedroom. Uh-huh. But it's quite surprising that she stayed here for nine days, from the 9th of November till the 18th of November. So she actually left the hotel and left Stavanger on the same day as she bought the rubber boots. And we're then just some days before she disappears for the last time. The Comfort Hotel, as it's called now, has a retro feel. It is and was a simple mid-range hotel in Stavanger, just a few minutes walk away from the shoe store and the port. The curved reception desk is in a slightly different place when we met Tuna Svanis, an elegant lady in her 60s with straight blonde hair who used to serve at the desk. She's also wearing rubber boots. This is the exact spot that Fenella Loch stood on when I talked to her. Really? Yes. She was coming in and asking for the key and she was staying in room 615, a very small single room without a bathroom and without toilets, so... And went straight into the elevator. Working alongside her in the Hotel San Svitten, as it was called then, was Ove Bernd Ramstrom, the bellboy. This lady, she, she had a suitcase on the back, so I, I offered her help. In, in a strange way, I, I remember it was this lift. Um, 
and uh, we went up to the sixth floor. Do you remember now we're going with the lift upstairs? Did did you, did you speak with her in the lift? Yeah. I don't know how the conversation started, but uh, I, I remember I, I I asked her where she came from because she had an ex accent. A special English accent when she sp she spoke and uh, um, she said she she came from Belgium 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 mm -hmm. Belgium Belgium yeah and I I don't think I've met a Belgian before <laughs> yeah. I think it first uh, and foremost it was the look of the lady that uh, paid my attention yeah yeah what about her look <laughs> she wasn't one of the crowd. Lot of makeup, red lips, and and very dark eyes, and dark hair, and she was quite, uh, you say, serious. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no smile. Uh, that's what I can say about it. What do you remember of her her face or her look? She had very dark hair. In a way, also the, the way she moved, up first, or her, um, um, the way she what she behaved. behaved, or the person she was actually. She was not talking very loud. She had a silent voice, but she, I didn't feel she was shy. I just felt she, she has an agenda, and she doesn't want to talk about it to anybody. I can remember very well. It was her sort of a hat gear, and I hadn't seen anything like it before, but I have now. Really? Yes, yeah, some sort of a fur hat, uh, but it was a bit worn out. I've seen those hats in, for example, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and those were actually Soviet states in 1970. And also, uh, of course, uh, the teeth with the gold and everything. I've seen them with teeth all golden or silver. They added in all their values in their teeth during the Soviet period, so it, the values shouldn't be confiscated. I would have thought of, of that today, but I didn't when I was 19. Kazakh hat, gold teeth. The Eastal woman would even stand out now in Stavanger with all its tourists, never mind in 1970. That hat reminds me of a detail from the police report from the crime scene. There was a fur hat actually found beneath the body. And it's a special thing about this hat, and I imagine it must be the same hat from the descriptions. Uh, in that fur hat, the police or the forensics, they managed to locate some small amount of petrol or fuel. Ooh, just, just a drop. That's significant because we've been wondering how uh, how the fire got started. There was no obvious fuel left behind or any any containers to hold fuel, no wood that burned which would have lit the fire. They found some remains of burned plastic in this boulder, but in my mind I think, well, if she or somebody carried fuel to lit the fire up there in a can or some cans, isn't it strange that they didn't find more remains of this fuel can or cans it's very strange either the cans completely combusted and there's nothing left of them in the fire or or somebody carried them away again and that somebody could have been the murderer if it was a murder and also i can remember very well when i was presented the ugly photograph photo from her being burnt in east town and i felt where am I going to go? Take the elevator, take the stairs, run away. <laughs> because it was, I think it was so scary. It was so spooky. It was so awful. Just to, to um, see the remains of her body. Ooh. Every time when I now hear, hear of uh, fires in, where people are getting burnt, I can see that photo from my inner eyes. It comes to me after 47 years. So I think it will never leave me. And I felt so sorry for her, in a way.
Tuna is talking about the police photos from the crime scene, showing the Eistal woman's badly burned body in Ice Valley. We've seen the pictures and they're shocking now, but they must have been even more so then. Norway also had a really low crime rate. It's still pretty low. But scenes like these were pretty rare. And in terms of the police, who was dealing with it at this early stage of the investigation? Was it just the Bergen police? Quite soon they realised that they needed help, so they called for the murder squad in Oslo and they came over to Bergen to, to help out. It was being treated as murder from the beginning. They showed me the photograph because I told them that she couldn't pronounce the S's in a proper way. Uh, in Norwegian we call it lespe. Lisp, yes, so, so same like the, English. Uh-huh. Yeah, yes, that's, yes, yes. that's... And so they asked, can you describe her teeth? And I said, there was a little bit of a gap between her f- front, front, upper front teeth. And um, they wanted to show me the f- <laughs> photo then. And it yes. was no doubt it was the same woman who was guest yeah, at this because hotel. because I recognised her teeth. Tuna has very detailed recollections that the Istal woman had a gap between her teeth and a lisp, quite recognisable features. And her name, Finella Lork, has stuck in her memory. The police must have got quite excited to suddenly have a name to go on, a nationality and a description, physical description. They were, we'll come to that. But wait, Tuna remembers a bit more. But I can, can remember her signature very clearly. Because I saw it, saw it twice. Mm-hmm. And she had a very sort of big F with the upper line was rather long and also the L from the Loch was some sort of an underscore for the surname. How come you, you notice this woman so clearly during her stay here <clears throat> before she got a big story in the newspaper? Mm. She was the only woman at that time I had seen staying alone as a woman in the hotel. Let's have a look at what the police actually got from this hotel in 1970. The Istal woman checks in as Finella Lorg from Belgium and is recognised by a witness. So we know... Finella was here, but we don't know is what she was doing here. Yeah, that's the big question. And interesting is we know from the hotel registration that she spent nine days at that hotel. That's quite a long time. I mean, even now, if you go somewhere to spend nine days somewhere, then you are on holiday normally. But that's also strange because why should she go to Stavanger for holiday as a foreign tourist in November? It's cold. Cold and dark. But that brings me back to the hotel registration card, which had her name. Was she a tourist at all? It would have said on there. Unfortunately, we cannot go back to that card and have a look because it's missing. It went missing during the investigation of the police. Tunas Vanas mentioned something about that she she got the feeling that this was a person on a special task. Mm. She had an agenda, she said. Yes. She even remembers Finella Lork's handwriting and her signature. Yes, that's another curious detail that the police focused on. And it was her handwriting on other hotel cards that is about to give the police their second major breakthrough. Could there be more than one Eastall woman? Next time on Death in Ice Valley, the mystery is about to multiply. <laughs>